I don't think there was ever a time in my life where I didn't know of Chris Ho. He was cute, he was smart, he had a sense of humour. That voice. You know, he had a very colourful exterior. He knew uh, what made music exciting for fans like me. He's pretty much like everything and, and under the name of art. He was, in my opinion, the real deal. I think he's a shining star. <laughs> Ho Wai Chi, later christened Chris by his godfather, was born into a very traditional Cantonese family. In a sense, his home environment fueled his love for music. Because my parents were so conservative and strict with me, you know, I was never the sort who would like run off after school. After school means you come home, you know. <laughs> so that my only refuge was just music really. And because I was still at home, so it was okay for me to listen to music. We got around to the point whereby they understood that, oh, uh, Chris will be glued to his uh, radio from 4 p.m. in the afternoon until 10 p.m. in the room by himself. The love affair with music would continue his whole life. He served his NS in the SAF Music and Drama Company. I first met Chris when uh, we were doing national service because I, I had such bad eyesight, they didn't let me uh, a hold a gun. So I joined the music and drama company. And there was Chris Ho, one of the first people I actually uh, met when I entered the studio. Then we immediately, immediately uh, uh, made friends. And I think that's when we made a very strong connection, very strong bond. And I remember when I joined the, 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 the performance items that they were doing was quite different from what they used to do. So he was part of the group that started to change the way MDC uh, uh, put up their items. He's, he was part of the modernization, I would say, of MDC. The number that I saw uh, which he was in was like a Broadway number with, I can't remember the costume exactly, but almost like top hat and tails and, and then he was doing that kind of like, you know, jazz hands kind of item. So, so it's very different from the Chris Ho that, that, that he evolved into. So I thought, okay, he's just doing this for fun and um, I, didn't, I didn't ever, ever think that he would make a career out of it. Chris, as a radio DJ, was very open to all genres. He did not let his personal taste um, influence what he played. The one word to describe him as a DJ is eclectic. Chris Ho's longest running profession was being a DJ, both on the airwaves and at clubs, where he got the name of DJ Mentor. His first gig was at Ready Fusion. There was a Ready Fusion program mm -hmm. called the Listener's Takeover. Yeah. So I was like a big music fan. I used to like go home, sit on the Ready Fusion set, listen to all my favorite pop songs, yeah. right? Then they had this program and said, write in and you can actually host the program yourself, pick your own songs and send out dedications and all that. So that was what I did. And six months later, after I've done it, I, I thought nothing of it. Six months later, they called me up and said, hey, we're looking for a part-time DJ. Uh, would you like to come and audition? And I thought, okay, well, just for the fun of it, you know. And it was Mike Ellery who, who Mike auditioned Ellery. me. Oh, he, he, was, he was the program's manager, okay. you know. And uh, I thought for sure I wouldn't pass the audition, but <sighs> I did. And I've stayed on ever since as a part-timer. Uh, I first noticed him as a listener when he was at Radio Fusion and just before I got into radio myself. We were his fans and listeners, not, not just Chris, of course, but whoever worked there, they were sort of a world apart. Radio DJs were like, wow. It was in 1991 uh, when I joined Radio Fusion. That was my first job actually out of the army. And of course, I've heard of Chris Hall, right? I knew that he was uh, in the music business. I knew he was an artist. I knew he was a radio DJ. Because we were colleagues, we started doing a lot of things together. We had this DJ workshop that Chris and myself were in charge with a few other DJs as well. Of course, he had a lot more experience 
than I had at that point. So, you know, it was interesting to see how he had a look at, at the way radio should have been done. I learned quite a few, a few things from him, just watching him uh, even being on air as well and how he prepared himself before a show. So I really, you know, was, was thankful that I had someone like Chris Ho to kind of learn from as well. In 1994, both Chris Ho and William X joined Radio Singapore International until it closed down in 2007. For 14 years, Chris and I were basically the music department of all the output. It was a specific hour because the music shows only happened uh, in the last hour of the daily broadcast. He did uh, local entertainment as well as entertainment news, the two shows. I did a world music program and chart music on two shows. So 9.30 between Chris and I, we had all the 9.30s covered. Chris would later join Lush FM, where his voice and love of music also gained him a following, even among fellow DJs. I was in Lush and uh, he was part of our team. For his show on Lush Clubscape, every Saturday there will be a one-hour live set done in the studio with a club DJ. The way when you watch him, how he would prep, you know, it's really just <sighs> that kind of dedication, you know, notes, scribbling, deck of CDs because he wanted to share about this music, about that music, you know, everything's ready and you know he was doing like the most tinkering with all the machines <sighs> and he was so smooth about it. That was the DJ, you know, that I remember him for and I think everyone loved and admired him for. When Lush closed down in 2017, Chris moved on to Gold 905, a move that seemingly clashed with his alternative music sensibilities. Honestly, I was surprised, only because, you know, it's kind of a radio station that is for the family. We play um, classic hits and it's a very easy listening station. And I don't think you would describe Chris Ho as easy listening. <laughs> you would think, you know, punk, indie, alternative rock, screaming with anger, anarchy. And of course, here's also the other persona, which was as a club DJ. And Chris, very interestingly, was very okay about, oh, it's all right, then I'll just start a different um, social media platform and that will be for my, my gold fans. And so he just fit right in seamlessly. He just slid into his role on the evening drive time. If you thought that a guy who's covered head to toe in tattoos of various kinds and in fact you could basically read his musical choices because he wore them like a badge of honour how are we going to convince our listeners that Chris Ho can make a decent case of Kenny Rogers and Dolly Parton? Is it, is it believable? The answer is yes because musically the guy was like this he specialised, of course, but doesn't mean he didn't know anything about the others. You know, that is the magic of his, in, in terms of his musical intelligence. It was his work as a radio DJ that got him noticed by the television producers in early years. It's a it was a Sony Betamax show because it was a time that Sony launched their Betamax VHS. <laughs> And my gallery was co-hosting it with me and Susan Lim. Hey, Chris, Thank you. That, was a, that was a quick change. <laughs> well, getting dressed in a hurry is but one of Chris's many talents. Thanks. So here with some sweet, sweet music is our Singapore lady, Anita Sarawak. <laughs> it was the first time a TV show had three hosts. And I just wanted a new, a new concept or having variety, you know, different compares to handle different things on the show and all that. But music was still Chris's first love, and he would set the local music scene on fire. If you think that I'm a nonconformist, maybe it's or in relation to music. Maybe I think it's more because I go for the what people might call the more progressive stuff, you know. And the reason why I do I like that is because uh, it's more exciting and it's more colourful, you know. And it what it's what keeps the whole spirit of the music going. 
In an era where rock music and the lifestyle it portrayed was frowned upon, Chris Ho became passionate about reviving local pop music. Zircon Lounge, Chris's second band after Transformer, heralded the start of the new wave punk-inspired music. The band came up with their first album, Regal Vigor, in 1983. Being the first in their field meant a unique set of difficulties. They didn't even have the right kind of producer uh, or engineer or studio to accommodate the, the, the Zircon Lounge Regal Vigor album. I remembered when we went in, we had to bring in our own uh, snare drum because they had put in uh, sacks of sand inside, the, inside the, the, the snare drum to soften the sound of the snare drum because it was meant to have the Tracy Huang sound. Drums cannot be cracklingly loud, no. And I remember when, when we kept telling the engineer, turn up the sound of the guitar. He was like, it's already maximum. Uh, like that. And we used to laugh about it. But that was really how it was. It was not easy. I mean, but that's why the Zircon Lounge Regal album, Regal Vigor album, uh, sounded so murky and so in a sense, uh, not what we wanted, because there really was no, uh, no experience in that field to record music of our nature. Uh, we were the very first. One musician who was part of this album was Dick Lee. Looking back, I'm also quite amazed at how my beginnings actually were with Chris. Chris Hall reached out to me. He needed a keyboardist. I went to a rehearsal studio, I remember that. Um, where he was with his band, I just added the keyboards. You know, I just did what I could to, to do that. And, and, and I think that was my first uh, proper entry into music properly. And one thing that really, um, really, really stands out in my memory is performing with Sir Con Lount at the Old National Theatre. I played <laughs> with the band. So I wasn't officially in the band, I was like the extra, you know. But um, I did that for a while until uh, Jimmy then asked me to do my own recording. Jimmy Wee was the managing director of record label Pony Canyon, who strongly believed in supporting local musicians. My boss Jimmy Wee, he was the only music executive that really believed in Singapore artists. He believed that if someone keeps putting their money and their faith behind a particular artist, someone is going to have that breakthrough. I think he saw Chris as someone who was unique, original, and Chris could somehow break into either the Thai market or the Southeast Asian market. So that's why the record label was willing to put their money and their name behind an artist like Chris. Or maybe things change, nothing's wrong with that. Down the road, Chris Ho would pay this belief in local music forward. The local bands that I see as you know, wonderful or great, I would try and make it a point to give them a certain kind of an exposure so that people will know about their music. Like for instance, I was the first to write about and to feature Humback Oak on the radio. Same goes for the Out Fellows. And the latest is Force Vomit. In my band, we started recording um, this thing called demo cassettes and we sent some songs to him. He liked it a lot and then he, he reached out and he said that he wanted to interview us for his column on the Straits Times. Naturally, I was blown away because I grew up reading his stuff, so it was, it felt like a validation. So we must have been about 18, 19 around that time, and then he was this veteran of the entertainment industry, of the media industry, so we were a bit intimidated. And then, you know, he had his tattoos, you know, he's somebody famous, and we were like nobody, we were just kids. But he, he was very reassuring, I remember. He made us comfortable enough to open up ourselves and talk about our music. He was genuinely curious about our stories. You know, some people just laugh at the band's name, but he was really curious to find out like, why. For kids back then, that was, a, that was an amazing moment. Those who worked with Chris found that behind that tough punk exterior was a man who was kind, passionate and creative. 
That album, uh, Bethlehem Sacrum, was quite a start for us. And, and it initially, it, it didn't got on as, a, as an album. It was supposed to be for a film fest. It was supposed to be for it's cinematic music for a soundtrack. But it changes to some form of a format. Still musically, it's there. So I, I guess this is what we're trying to achieve. It's something very different from, from normalcy. So, yeah. Chris always sought to break new ground with his music. He went for synth-pop in his first solo album, Night Songs in Day Glow, in 1989. Then Punk Monk Hunk album was the first time he used Chris Ho with an X, and it was named one of the year's best albums by Tokyo's Music Magazine. 1999, X with an X Me All Good No Bad was a spoken word album. No Ordinary Country in 2009 was Singapore's first protest folk album. And Singapura Uba Alis in 2010 was a satire containing both sung and spoken word tracks. Towards the end, Chris was still working to produce more music. We work on an experimental EP that uh, came out like this year, May, called Adventures of Ying Yao. It was one of his last projects that's, on, that's is out, out on the net. And also, there are, there are some music that we have collaborated over the years. It's, it's like, it's all in the vault. I've yet to go back to the vault and, and gather it. I, I'll, I'll try to work on and, and, and carry on his legacy musically. And, and yeah, that's how I remember him as a true friend. Three years ago, I started talking about wanting to get back and recording original music or my, my songs again. And I did mention it to, to him because we go out quite often and I say, yeah, I really want to do this. Uh, just got to find a, a musical direction for myself. The last time he came to our, our place for dinner, which was sometime in June, uh, he brought that up again. So I said, okay, I tell you what, Chris, okay, we've been talking about this for a few years. Why not you produce me? And then Val said, why not you do an EDM version of a song that I've already recorded for my upcoming EP? I said, okay, that's a good idea. So on a Sunday, we started the whole ball rolling. So one week after that, we had completed the song. And uh, Wednesday is when he went into the hospital and never got out again. So when that happened, I realized that that was his final gift. I thanked him, I got to thank him. I really felt glad that I could do that for giving me that final gift. I look forward to every Friday because I knew his music columns were going to be out. He made me super curious about what he was writing about. You know, I, I wanted to know uh, about this band. I've never heard of these bands, a lot of these bands and these artists that he wrote about. But it made me want to find out because the way he wrote it was so beautiful. You know, he, as I said, he was a big fan, so he knew uh, what made music exciting for fans like me. He covered a lot of the uh, the Singapore music scene as well. There was one particular column that he had. He went down to this, uh, this gig, this concert at the substation. There were bands like Stomping Ground and Nunsex, and um, these are all back then super underground, as far away from the mainstream as you could get. So I was too young to go to shows and all that, so I didn't know about these bands, but I discovered these bands through his column in the Straits Times. And I read a, his review of what happened at the shows. People were slam dancing, you know, there was stage diving and all that. And all this was very exciting to a kid because you've never heard of all these things before. This was before the internet and all that. So I discovered about uh, all these subcultures, all these music subcultures through these columns. And I discovered that, you know, Singapore had a thriving indie and underground scene at that time. Began working live uh, in Straits Times as a reporter and Chris at the time was writing uh, Pop Life, which was a which was column. He was in the building one day and I remember like there's this boy I knew from school that was looking and coming to me so excitedly and saying you know what oh, is really finally happening is a is this like this independent music magazine that is going to focus on local musicians he was really excited and exuberant writing for Big O allowed Chris to spread his musical influence and his opinions even further his columns would expand into socio-political commentaries and eventually he would write three books Skew Me, You Rebel Me, Attack of the SM Space Invaders and How to Be More Win-Win Than the MM I met Chris because I was asked to design his first book uh, Skew Me, You Rebel Me, which is this one He didn't want a lot of things changed but he requested for a photo to be 
put to the back. And the photo that he gave me was this one, which is him with his naked butt, which was quite shocking because I've only just met him, not, for, not very long before this book. And there he is showing me his naked butt. <laughs> By the essence of it, it's a um, struggle of his thoughts about being Singaporean and being in Singapore. So the, the icon of just using a, a restless, right, to, to show that struggle. I think like many of us, Chris too had, had a desire for Singapore to be something else, right? An ideal, the ideal Singapore. And for him, it's like uh, that there's so much good, goodness that he has found in his experiences in, thai, in Thailand and Thai culture that he wished we had in Singapore as well. Sometimes when I read, I, I, I find it about him. Um, I don't think he hates Singapore. I think he really loves Singapore uh, to the sense that he wished it was better uh, in many ways. That's why he, he writes all these jokes. I think that more conventional or conservative people would think that his social commentary <clears throat> comes from hatred, but absolutely the opposite. His social commentary comes from love because he loved the country so much. He wanted the best. If he was a cynic or if he was entirely blasé, then why bother? But I think he was optimistic, actually, for, his critics, for all his seemingly negative points of view. It wasn't negative so much that he wanted things to be better because they can be better. One memory that, that I had was just noticing him, how uh, gentle he can be and how thoughtful he can be when uh, we're having a meal at a hawker centre and, and uh, um, that there would be, you know, it's dirty. You get ants on the table and, and naturally, like, if I see an ant, I'll just squish it, right? But for Chris, it's like he, he, he used his finger to shoo it away. I thought you know, that that was something that is very respectful uh, maybe it came from his uh, Buddhist learnings, right? To, to respect life in all forms. Now that I listened to Pama Hang all over again last night, it was a whole different experience because I, I get to know him for, for so long. It's his voice and everything, it still rings true. And, and this time around, it's more heartfelt. You see? So I think, yeah, it's also one of the things that I, I get to remember him. You know, I just put on a CD and his voice comes out. Chris Ho had a sweet tooth to match his super sweet nature. Um, he just couldn't resist. He was like, oh, I really should stop. It's so bad, so bad. There was one time we were filming an episode of my food guide, Makan Kakis. And for that series, I invited the different DJs to cook for me and show off their cooking skills. And Chris was like, I don't have any, so I'm just going to microwave you my favourite breakfast, which was oats that he had, you know, zhuzhed up. And the funny thing was, um, he sweetened it with, I kid you not, his mother's Ensure milk powder. I was like, what is this? And he said, oh, it's so delicious. It's very aromatic. It's like vanilla, but it's very sweet. And then as a topper, he would treat himself every morning when he made his oats with a gummy candy. So that was like his cherry on top. And uh, that made me laugh so hard. There's one thing I really appreciate about Chris was when I left Pony Canyon, um, he was the only artist that kept in touch with me. He made sure that I was, he was always a part of my life after that. He knew I went on to do freelance projects and would engage me on a freelance basis to help him with his projects too. He wasn't a rebel without a cause. He was fighting for something he believed in, which was, you know, for that local spirit to rise up, especially in the world of music, movies, um, writing. Uh, he did his very best. He contributed so much. I think there was something tender about Chris that I always was very mindful of. Yeah. He was a... He was a very... gentle person. And I was never harsh with him. And... Um, I've been a teacher a lot of my life. I've been a teacher as well as an actor. And my former students will tell you that I don't 
pull punches, I don't mean words. But with Chris, I don't know. I was always, I always, I always wanted to manja him. Yeah. Excuse me. The seven of us, my family, John, my two daughters, Chris, Lyndon and Bart, we were known as the special seven to Chris. And we always made sure that he felt really good every time he saw us. On the 26th of June, they were supposed to get together, the last time as a group. Initially, he didn't want to come because one, he never ever turns down any of the dinner invitation. It was something he always looked forward to, always looked forward to. But that day, he, he said he didn't want to come. One, because he had his home improvement project to, to think of. And two, he said his stomach was not too good. But we said, well, we think you need it. Maybe you're too stressed, so come and de-stress. And when he came, we gave him a big hug. When he was about to leave, we gave him another hug. And who would have thought that would be the last group hug? Then 7th July, he sent us a text, I can remember so clearly, 7th July, at 10 something at night. He said, I'm in hospital. And I think two days after, he sent us a text in the early morning. He said, brace yourself, it's stage four. So we all thought he was just pulling a, a prank on us, but it was confirmed, chances were slim. We tried to encourage him as much as we could and he was very thankful. He said that helped him to stay focused on trying to heal himself. Um, he was very sure that he was going to recover. He, uh, he WhatsApp me about a work that we were going to do together. He said he, don't think, he doesn't think he could make it. I said, why? And he said, call me. And we spoke and he told me. But he was always very hopeful that it was something he could beat. We were not able to see him for the two months he was undergoing treatment, obviously because of uh, the pandemic and hospital rules, safe distancing. And I think that that's possibly what made it harder. He was such a people person. He liked connection, human connection, and to be isolated in that way. When I think about it, I, I wish it wasn't so. I wish that you know, I'd been able to hold his hand, hug him, tell him face to face how much he meant to us. It was really, really shocking when the morning a friend texted me and asked whether uh, Chris is gone. I think like everybody else, I only found out that morning and I started calling up people in the radio industry and to my horror, I found out that it wasn't just a joke. He nodded courteously and knew who I was Though I didn't know who he was till I realised And there were people who came who did not know Chris and I think that is an indication of that, of how much Chris touched lives in Singapore. He was reaching out to these people in such an impactful way that they had not met him at all, couldn't bring themselves to see him until they composed themselves. And when they did, they broke down crying and, you know, it was emotional. So I want to thank you for your contributions. I think we will miss you greatly. But I think I went deeper than just an affair. So now all I can say is thank you, Chris. Thank you for everything. You're gonna shine on. Thank you, Chris. I love you. So long, Chris, and thank you for the love. Um, as you say, we will we'll meet again. And remember, you're beautiful, pure, and perfect. I just want to say that I miss you, and I love you very, very much. You'll always be with me. 
we really lost someone who was uh, very valuable to the Singapore music industry and the, and the whole entertainment industry, I believe. Chris Ho, I love you, man. Punk, monk, hunk. Forever 27. Year by year, though I think I went deeper than just an affair. Deep